Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe subscribe to the RSS feed and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn about investing in and managing income properties for college students, there's a show for that. If you want to learn how to get noticed online and in social media, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to save on life's largest expense, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know about America's crime of the century, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com. Or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. My pleasure to welcome Dr. Chris Smith. He is a podcaster in the United Kingdom, and he runs the Naked Scientist podcast and has done some great work with it. And it's great to have him on with us today. How are you, Chris? I'm very well. Thank you, Jason. And you? Good. Fantastic. Thank you. So now you said you were out in the boonies. Where exactly are you coming to us from today? Okay, well, I live outside of Cambridge. I'm an employee of Cambridge University and Cambridge University's teaching hospital because I'm both an academic and a medical doctor. And in order to do my on-call duties, which I have to do for the hospital various weekends and evenings and things, I have to live fairly close to the hospital. So I actually live about six miles from the centre of Cambridge, and it's a village called Barrington, which uh, is about... Well, it sort of certainly dates back to medieval times. I, I found some records of my house and the pub in the village dating back about 500 years. I live opposite the pub, which is a distraction, but it's a nice view. Uh-huh. <laughs> Fantastic. So how, how did a doctor become interested, uh, a doctor and a professor, I guess, become interested in, in podcasting? Well, actually, it was much earlier than that. Um, I did what we call an MB-PhD. It's what you guys in America call an MD-PhD. And we had a program set up here in Cambridge University so that people who were uh, geeks and anoraks like me could do their research and get a PhD in the middle of their medical degree. So you go to university, you do a degree to start with, and you do a medical degree and a PhD nested inside one another, and you do the whole thing in eight years. And while I was doing my PhD, and I worked on virology, I was interested in herpes simplex viruses that cause cold sores, rather than the downstairs variety of herpes simplex. And I ended up doing some things for the Cambridge Science Festival, which was occurring during our National Science Week. And it's a brilliant initiative. Cambridge opens the doors to the university. All the scientists do things for the general public. And it gets about 40,000 people coming through the doors, completely free, to just come and see, over the course of a week or two, what the university gets up to. And as a PhD student, I got involved for a couple of years doing that. And in the second year I was doing it, I did an experiment to get DNA out of everyday objects using things you find in your kitchen, everyday ingredients in other words. So you can use things like salt to stabilize the DNA, washing up liquid to break open cells and get it out. You can use warm water to bust open the cells and then pineapple juice to degrade the protein and aftershave because it's got isopropanol in it to precipitate the DNA, that kind of thing. It was just fun. <laughs> That's quite and, fascinating. Um, now, well, now, what do you do with I, I've got to ask you before you go on to the next point, what do you do with that DNA that you break out in your kitchen? <laughs> Well, it looks just like snot, actually. Oh, okay. So uh, there's not a lot you can do with it apart from show it to people. But the thing is, this happened in the late 90s at the height of the GM food scandal. And there were pictures of 
Frankenstein and, you know, green men and DNA helices and even DNA helices twisting the wrong way all over the media. And so I was trying to do something like this, which already would capitalize on the public's interest. So people just liked the fact that you didn't need a fancy lab and high-end, very expensive um, apparatus and ingredients in order to do something simple like extract uh, DNA molecules. So it was really just to, to get the public interested, and then I could teach them a bit about DNA. But there was this radio producer who was producing a, a program for a commercial radio station in Cambridge over the course of the Cambridge Science Festival, and they said, oh, would I come in and just chat about what we were doing um, for National Science Week? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And I turned up, and what we thought was going to be about five minutes of interview turned into a two-hour show of playing music, and people would phone in with questions. And they said, oh, this is rather good. Why don't you come again? And so I went again a couple of weeks later, dragged in some friends from the lab and said, you're going on the radio, you're going to answer science questions, talk about your research and that kind of thing. And it became a sort of institution. We did that for about six to eight months. And then I started thinking, well, why are we appearing on other people's programs? I think that uh, we could do much better if we had our own program. So I convinced the radio station to name a price to let me buy a year's airtime off of them to create a radio show all about science on a Sunday night. And then I had to raise the money, so I went to various places, grant awarding bodies, and I sweet-talked them into uh, buying into this idea and walked into the radio station with this check, and their jaws hit the ground, but they, they launched the project. And so for the millennium, year 2000, we started making this radio show, and we did it for a year, and then I thought, well, it's a shame because we're spending a week preparing an hour of live science radio show, and anyone who lives outside of Cambridge, because the, the station was quite small, the broadcast radi radius wasn't very big, uh, anyone who, who lives outside of that radius or doesn't tune in at 6 o'clock on a Sunday evening, they're going to miss the show. Why don't we translate this to the internet and put it into a format that people in all time zones and all geographies can download on demand? Because at the time, people were doing streaming and things, but no one was offering audio for download. So in the year 2001, we created nakedscientist.com and migrated all of our back catalogue onto the website and effectively fashioned one of the world's first podcasts. And we were offering our audio and our back catalogue for download, um, initially in a non-subscribable, but then in a subscribable format since then. And as a result, we went from a tiny audience just around Cambridge to a very large audience very quickly. And then when iTunes launched the iTunes Music Store's podcast category, we were one of the first podcasts listed there, and certainly amongst the first science podcasts in the whole world. And so our stuff just went straight up the charts, and we, we attracted a very big following of very loyal people. What year were you first on iTunes then? Well, we, we went into iTunes when they first launched um, the podcast category in the music store, which was 2005. I sat there, it was June 2005, or May, June 2005, and I sat in my living room um, thinking, how do I adjust these RSS feeds so they're iTunes friendly? And I was wading through all this iTunes literature, and I, I sort of took the morning off work, and I sat in the living room, and I wrote the feeds and submitted it, and then almost overnight it blew up our server because we, we literally, I think, added an order of magnitude to the number of people downloading our material. And, and the server melted. And I, I later spoke to iTunes about this, and they said, um, oh, yes, this is dubbed the iTunes effect. People all over the world started to complain that they, they broke their servers and they maxed out their server connections, that kind of thing, because they, they couldn't cope with the, the sudden demand. But it was great. You know, it was wonderful for the first time um, in, in trying to do this project. We, we really, really started to see a lot of people tune into our material and, and not just tune in but keep coming back and also then say very nice things very positive things which gave us enormous encouragement which is really important because in those days of course we were just groping in the dark not many people were making science shows then certainly no one was making science podcasts and we were doing something which we thought people would like and then when the feedback started to come in we thought yeah it's worth doing this is worth doing this we're, we're doing something that people like so we'll carry on so that's just an amazing story. You were there so early in the game. Give us an idea as to the growth of your show. When, when you say it, it broke servers and people were complaining about the iTunes effect in the beginning, what kind of numbers were you looking at or were you even tracking them back then? Well, our data is a little bit patchy because when servers blow up, they tend to take their contents with them. And, and I've learned the hard way about backing things up now. Um, luckily, we have still got our audio catalog back from the early days, but not all the logs. But when we used to just publish things um, in a trivial way back in the very early days, we might move a thousand copies of, of our shows in a week, let's say. And then when iTunes joined the party, it suddenly went to 12,000 copies in a day. And now we do anything up to you know, three quarters of a million program downloads in a month. 
Um, and so and how, how many, just distinguish, how many episodes is that? So if you if you have a quarter million downloads in a month, is that one episode per week? Well, it's, it's three quarters of a million downloads in a month, um, up to a million. It depends on, I mean, some months it'll be busier than others. It depends on whether you get featured or not. But the, the answer is that we now have an incredibly large back catalogue as well because we've got at least 500 hours of audio catalogue. And the really surprising thing is that people will still continue to dip into material the, the we old make. episodes, yeah, right. right. Exactly, yeah. A, 10 years ago, which is really gratifying because you can see in many of these stories that we cover, and people write to us about this, and they say it's, it's nice to see the scientific journey because there'll be things that we cover a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago, and we'll say scientists at MIT or scientists in Oxford, Cambridge, wherever, have done this, and they think that using this they may be able to do that with it. And then five years later, lo and behold, you see the same name cropping up and they've done the clinical trial or they've, they've sent the probe to Mars or something and here's the data. And it's really nice to see that journey and see the loop closing each time. And, and I want to eventually get to a point where we can, we can take a look at, at how much of that science really has completed that journey and do some special episodes where we, we go back to some of the really early material and, um, and, and feed it in. As one person said to me the other day, we're almost into our anecdotage now. Yeah, fanta- that's fantastic. Now, but how many, what, what is your episode schedule? Are you releasing episodes regularly or sporadically? How often? Well, we actually employ a reasonable sized team because around the success of this, I was able to raise quite a lot of money um, from grant awarding bodies and other people who work with us. Um, partners in the project are uh, research councils in the UK, the University of Cambridge, and also Rolls-Royce. And that investment has enabled us to take on some staff. And so we have a, a powerful nucleus now of very, very talented people who are scientists first and foremost and have also learned skills in journalism. And by putting the two together, that's our production team. And so we now actually make about five broadcasts a week to various radio stations around the world. Much of that then gets translated into podcasts. So we have our flagship Naked Scientist show, which goes out. and We, we actually have airtime on the BBC where we broadcast that program live and then we take the digital impression of the program away and we reversion it and release it on the Tuesday as the Naked Scientist podcast, the Tuesday following the Sunday on which it was broadcast live. And that two day gap gives us time to prepare a transcript and all the supporting web pages because everything we do, we document and archive so that we've got full transcripts of Intelligent Verbatim with links to the supporting materials, all of the references to back up the stories we've covered so that we've got a really powerful resource around all of what we've done and it means that then people can critique it they can also make sure that it's right and uh, it's great for people whose english isn't that strong because they can read the transcript and listen to the audio and it's like a self-made learning package it is right that's one of the great things it's it's a it's a it's a language course as well as a science course you know on your um website the naked scientist.com now that's plural scientist with an s at the end there are several podcast feeds there naked genetics naked astronomy naked archaeology naked oceans naked science scrapbook what are those are those additional shows that you're producing or your team is producing yeah, it, it became apparent pretty quickly that our production capacity within our team was much greater than the airtime capacity that we had. And also that there are certain elements of science which will suit very well a very specialist audience, but not a general audience. And similarly, there are areas of a general science show where you would like to go deeper into a subject, but there's not the airtime, or you're worried that it will alienate some aspects of the audience. Those sorts of elements fit very well into single-strand specialist programming. So what we've done is to create some parallel strands, all following the, the naked brand. So we have naked astronomy, as you say, naked oceans, naked archaeology, naked engineering, that kind of thing. And instead of having a 15 or 20 minute interview in the main show, we might have five minutes in the main show, and then that is actually lifted from a very specialist 15 minutes in one of those substrands. And the substrands are monthly, whereas the main show is weekly. And it means that then we can provide people who have a really specialist focused interest in some of those niche areas with a really, really detailed, fulfilling listen. And they get more of a, uh, an overview or a general or news dominated listen from our main show. And, and so it's a good way of maximizing our attraction to the audience because we're able to give people who are really, really interested in a certain subject 
just that subject, or if they're interested in listening across the board, they can get a more general listen off of our main show, and one can feed into the other. We can cross-promote and exchange content between them, and that's worked incredibly well. The Naked Astronomy program does extremely well for a monthly show, which is notoriously hard to launch because trying to get it known, and because it's only updating monthly, trying to get the audience into it can be a challenge and that one does brilliantly yeah that's fantastic so you're repurposing the content onto these other more specialized shows and using it twice recording once which is handy. well in some cases you're, you're, I, mean, I have to i have to do the producers justice because right. there are some elements in those specialist the, shows that, are, that people were original, use in the main show but right. on the whole they contain bespoke content which is specialist and detailed. We may refer to it in our main show, but on the whole, you will find unique content in those substrands. And it's just that it takes a month uh, to accumulate that unique content um, because we're using extra production time we have across the month that we wouldn't use for the, for the main show. And I had a feeling that you had unique content as well. So typical episode length for your main show? Well, they're all an hour. And the reason for that was really sort of foisted on us by the BBC. And, and, and that was a legacy of our early days on commercial radio where we got one hour because I said, well, we want an hour show. And because we learned a good format and we learned to fill an hour and we have a very good idea as to what will go into an hour, and I think people will tolerate an hour. I'm not sure they would tolerate more than an hour except on special occasions. Um, we think that an hour is about the ma maximum we can get away with. Everyone told me it would never work when we started. They said an hour is far too long. The, the maximum people will put up with is half an hour. And actually, we've surveyed thousands of people who listen to the show now, and, and in fact, 99% of respondents to our surveys tell us they listen to the whole show in one go. So the main show is an hour, so it's an hour a week. The substrands vary, um, but we try to make them about half an hour. And uh, interestingly, I've interviewed quite a few podcasters for this sort of new series that we're doing on podcasting. And many of them, uh, unbelievably, say they go an hour and a half. And it seems long to me as well. So, so that's interesting that you've actually done surveys and you have empirical data on that. And an hour seems to be at least your optimum number for your, your style of show. Now, in terms of the format of the show, is it just you? Is it a uh, guest that you bring in? Is it co-hosted? How is that? Really, really a mixture. What we do is each show has at least two, if not three, anchors on it, three presenters. And they share out the hosting role of the show and the reason for having multiple voices like that is that it means that it appeals to a wide audience it means that we can be gender neutral because we have a gender neutral production team and presenting team and i think that's important because uh, and that's reflected actually in the audience data we have because we have uh, compared with other science shows for which we have data um, we have a very high female listenership it's close to parity it's about 35 percent which compared with other shows I've seen data for is about three or four times better. And I think that is, um, and I'm pleased to see that because it's a reflection on the fact we have made a conscious effort to have a, a good balance in terms of the, um, the number of males and females we've put on our production bench and on our presenting team, but also the number of people we choose as guests for the show. Because the way we format each of the programs, three out of four programs are themed. And what I mean by that is we will pick an important topic. Last week, for example, was the body clock, circadian rhythms. Every single thing on Earth that, that's living has a clock ticking away inside it that's run chemically. So time is pretty important to living things. But how does it work? How does it impact on human health and disease? How does it affect the world around us? So we did a show on that. The structure of that program was to get uh, two guests in the studio. So we had one researcher from Oxford University, Russell Foster, and another researcher from Cambridge University, Ak Reddy, both of whom are body, body clock gurus, they opened the show and they were interviewed and they talked about their science and their research. Then nested in the middle for about 20 minutes, we have a news roundup. And the reason for putting the news in the middle of the program is that it gives us a chance to marshal all of the comments and calls and emails and texts that come in from people listening to the guests so that after the news, we can then have another pre-recorded package which uh, in this case we talked to some researchers in Boston who are looking at uh, people who are sleep deprived and the fact that they end up when their sleep wake cycle is disturbed eating far too much and they end up pre-diabetic so we were looking at that then we have a, a sort of open forum discussion and all of the questions that have been piling in um, get put to the contributors to the program and we have a round table type uh, Q&A session with them and then we finish the show with an element that we set up about four or five years ago now, but it's become very successful, and that's our question of the week. And what we do is set a question, 
sometimes the question is relevant to the show topic that week. Sometimes it's not. But we'll pick a fun, funky question and we'll ask that question, but we'll give the answer the following week. And the idea is then that people hear the question and it gives them a week to contribute by email to go onto our forum and, and tap answers and, de and debate the, the topic on our website. And then the following week, we can bring together all of that uh, wisdom and a gold standard answer from an international authority, which is made into that piece that closes the show, along with the question for the next week. And that, that's really nice. It drags people from one week to the next. When you said you do the news in the middle of the show, I was thinking, are you also podcasting live? Or, or no, you're saying it, it's the week before that you accumulate questions. It's, it, it, do you do anything live? The, the entire program is an hour of live radio, and that's how it starts live. Yo, so we'll you you mean it's on, it's on live terrestrial radio? Yeah, the BBC right. broadcasts oh, okay, the program okay. on BBC and, Radio. And then, it's, then it's also podcasted, I see. I just wanted to make that Correct. And we, so we, we take that, and that's how we're fortunate. And it gives us really part of our unique selling point, which is the interaction with a live audience in that way means that then people react to the program content. So the questions that come in tend to be representative of what the average audience member wants to know about. And then that means that when they are and other people are listening to the program, the content isn't our best, guess of, our best guess of what we think people want to know about. It's both a combination of what we think people should know about, but also what people who have phoned in and influenced the program have asked. So it's therefore directly relevant from that perspective as well. And it seems to be quite a good formula. Yeah, fantastic, that is. Just back to clarification on the BBC element. When did the BBC start broadcasting you? Well, I approached them in 2003, I won an award um, from the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust, which is a foundation, a charitable foundation based in London. And the aim of that trust, which was set up in the name of, of Winston Churchill, was to be a living memory to Winston Churchill to provide resources to people who were offered a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And I was at that time just working in London as a hospital doctor, but I was still making these science programs. But I'd never had any proper formal training in how you do radio. And I went up to the Churchill Trust and I said, I've been given an opportunity by a broadcaster, Robin Williams, at the ABC in Australia to go and join him in Sydney for six months and they will teach me properly how to make good quality science programs. And the Churchill Trust uh, awarded me one of their fellowships for that year or the following year. And they put out a press release and it went to one of the BBC radio stations in the east of England where I originally came from because that was my sort of home area and they phoned me up and said would I come in and talk about it and I walked into this BBC station and um, I said Have, can I play you something and one of the program controllers said sure what do you want to play us and I said well I'll play you something off the internet and they were so gobsmacked because most people didn't have a radio show on the internet as well at that time so I said well pick any show you like from the back catalogue and they picked a few programs and they listened to a few of them and they said this is fantastic um, don't call us we'll call you you hear that a lot in radio but about two days later my phone rang and these guys are saying uh, will you come and do some special shows for us on our bank holidays in, in May 2003 and uh, off the back of that we'll see whether we can do something and um, sure enough those shows went incredibly well and uh, they said right when, when you uh, start your new series which we were going to do in the autumn they said we're going to start taking this and so before we knew it instead of just one BBC radio station we had a whole cluster of them because they were all connecting in, all the studios were all interlinked and connecting in on a Sunday evening for our show live. So instead of just getting to one county, we were doing the whole of the east of England um, with a potential audience of six million people. And, and to go from, from almost nowhere to that overnight <laughs> was amazing. You know, it's an incredible opportunity and, and we really made the most of it. But it, it was scary to start with because, you know, who was I? I was just this, um, this little doctor and scientist type person who was dabbling with media. But we learned quickly and worked out what people wanted and how to do it, we think, quite well. And when we got a bit more success and got the iTunes numbers, then I was able to go up to big big uh, funding bodies and say, right, will you get behind me and, and give me some resources to get some staff? Do you care to share how much money you raised? We're now, uh, we've raised about one and a half million pounds. So um, Equivalent uh, in dollars? Between two and a half and three million dollars we've probably had in, in total support and in-kind support, yeah. Fantastic. Congratulations. That is quite an accomplishment. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. Here's your chance to catch up on all of those Creating Wealth shows that you've missed. There's a three-book set with shows 1 through 60, all digital download. You save $94 by buying this three-book set. Go ahead and get these advanced strategies for wealth creation. 
For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. So do you have any monetization strategy, you know, in addition to raising money to support the show? Are you selling anything? Are there courses being offered? Are there products? Well, our initial mission was to get ourselves a strong team built, get ourselves a strong brand built, and I think we sort of check off both of those now. Um, Our next big target is to sort our website out because it's still in the dark ages. We've put most of our energy into content generation. So our next, now we've got that sorted. Um, we're now going to get the website looking a bit more spruce because it looks like something from uh, <laughs> sort of I don't know from the early era of the internet. It's like it's, it's almost kind of fashionable again because it's so old and rickety. So we're sorting that out. And it's then retro that, style. Yeah, we're retro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very nicely put. I mean, as one person said, you could also say classic. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, the thing was, when we built the site, um, we didn't have very much content. We had you know a few hours of audio. And, and it's become uh, huge. And there must be 45, 50,000 pages, we think, of, of website. It draws hundreds of millions of hits. Um, I mean, we were doing 300 million hits plus about three years ago. So I don't know what, <laughs> what it is now. Uh, it's eye-wateringly big bandwidth bills, if you're not careful. But the, the interesting thing is that off the back of that success, I was able to go to one of our leading internet service providers in the UK, a company in Manchester called UK Fast. And I have uh, been very well treated by them because they agreed in return for us putting mentions of them in the beginning of our program that they would provide us with all the server resources that we need. So we get very, very high-end, very good quality servers um, and a lot of bandwidth and a lot of support. And it all comes for nothing in return for us mentioning. Do, Do you know what the monetary equivalent is, what the server benefit would cost if you had to just buy it? Yes. I mean, if, if I wanted to go and buy that server, or if I wanted to rent that server, because it's in a data center fully Rent-renting managed. Renting it you know, would the, be better, the, the a managed server. Right. You're looking at 25000 so that's probably about $45,000 a year's worth of computer resources that, that uh, effectively that, uh, that the advertising of them brings in. So I- immediately we, we're not draining cash to try and run our web presence. So that's been a huge help because what that meant I was able to do is basically have an extra member of staff because money I would have spent on all the server resources because it's very server hungry, this project. Instead, we had cash free to employ someone extra and that meant we could invest extra in the content generation. And that means we could give, give people more of what they want and give them better quality of what they want. Um, so that was the sort of first toe in the water. So now we're sorting out the website and we're beginning to, to say, right, now we've consolidated and we know where we're going. We're getting a bit more confident. The next step is to say, can we now exploit this resource and monetize it, but remain impartial? Because our number one, number one priority is to make sure that people don't feel that they're hearing propaganda. Because the, the major concern is if they hear a program that was supported by, say, an oil company, but then the program does climate change, people would obviously question. They say, well, you know, so the money's flowing in from this oil company, and you're telling me about climate change. Can I really believe the numbers? Um, so we're, we're very sensitive to that because absolutely 100% we, we put our science at the top of the pecking order. We, we put the science first and we worry about other things later. And it, we don't want anything to harm the integrity or, or the way in which people regard um, our coverage of science. Because in our feedback surveys and things, when we ask people to rank a series of sources for trustworthiness, we had a journal article. And then we had uh, Naked Scientists, and we had television programs, other radio programs, uh, blogs, newspapers, and so on. People were ranking the quality of the scientific message that they get from the Naked Scientist as number two, only to a science journal. In other words, the, the primary source of the data. And, um, and I, I've got to acknowledge the, the efforts of Diana O'Carroll, who worked with me and came up with the idea of, of doing that piece of research, because that was very, very important to us. It's very telling that people really trust the science they hear in our program, and we, we really value that. Very good points. So advertising of the server company, and no other advertising so far, right, because of the impartiality? No, I mean, I think we're okay with that, because um, it, it's a bit like, you know, I think I think we'd probably be okay with things like, say, telephony or something, because um, we that, wouldn't... That's neutral, that, right. Exactly. Right, yeah, we'd, yeah. we'd go for things which were neutral, but it, it, we'd, we would be very sensitive, because I don't want to distort the message. We also do, of course, acknowledge in the programs... Um, if people like research councils support us. So we've got funding from our Natural Environment Research Council, our Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council and Rolls-Royce, um, and also 
uh, the Wellcome Trust, who have been a major, major supporter and helper um, throughout the project. They actually got it going in the first place. They gave me my first grant. So we acknowledge those individuals or those charities at the end of our program and say thank you very much to them and where people can find out a bit more. We also acknowledge them online. Those uh, are in impartial research charities and also we retain complete editorial control. So although they're giving us money to make sure that we have balanced representation of all the sciences in our programming, they are not in any position nor are they allowed to say you have to cover X, Y or Z. They're perfectly at liberty to say the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council has just invested an enormous amount of money in this supercomputer. Um, would you like to talk to the uh, researcher who, or whatever, uh, at the University of Edinburgh who we're going to get running it? And it's up to us if we decide that, that uh, we want to cover that story. But uh, th at no time can they, can they tell us what to put in our programs. And, and we make that very clear, and they're, they're absolutely clear about that too. So it's completely transparent. We, we, we think that um, and that's very important because we don't want people to think there's a, any kind of bias here. Do you accept uh, donations from listeners? Well, we're going to in the future. But at the moment, we haven't asked for any. Um, we haven't sought anything like that because um, the one thing that brings out the worst in people is money. And what we don't want to do is to become sort of slaves to or dependent on, on people giving us money. We'd rather people at the moment come to listen to the program and, uh, and demonstrate with their mouse clicks why, that they like it. Um, and then when we feel that we've got a position, um, our, our position consolidated and a project in mind that we want to fund, like the regeneration of our website, then we're going to put out a call and say to people, OK, if you like this program, please send us a few quid and uh, we'll invest it in doing X, Y, or Z. But, but actually handling those sorts of donations on the scale that we would need to receive them, um, we need to make sure we've got really, really solid, trustworthy systems in place that are all transparent and accountable so that we, we make sure that it's clear to people where their money's going and that, that their, their credit card detail's not going to get sold to people or something. And, and that I want to be absolutely clear about before we, we go down that path. And how big is your staff? You mentioned hiring another staff member because you saved money on the server fees. What type of organization is, is there around the show? Okay, well, we've got me, and I do half the week um, working in the Naked Scientist's office, and the other half of the week I work in the hospital, and the other half of the week I work teaching medical students, vet students, and natural sciences students at Cambridge University. In other words, basically I'm doing three jobs, and I overlap everything. In the office full-time is a guy called Ben Valsler. He's been with us for five years, and he is the core producer of what we do. Um, he's a real visionary guy. Um, he's very, very organized and really, really talented as a, both a producer and a presenter. He also makes our Naked Astronomy program. Working with him is a guy called Dave Ansel, who's a physicist. And so he is our physics brain. He makes sure that the physics and the physical sciences content that goes into our programming is absolutely rock solid and he's got a very low threshold for picking up rubbish and so he, he'll just sort of sound the alarm if anything has got anything wrong with it and we, we put it right before it goes anywhere near a microphone and so Dave works full time and he does that and also helps us to um, make live shows we go to schools and we do live events in front of big audiences we blow things up and do stage shows science stage shows and Dave helps to organise exciting experiments and demonstrations for that um, we've got a half time person called Mira Senthalingam and she does half-time working on the Naked Scientist project as ring fence time. And then she does extra work freelance. Me and her work together to do certain projects that we do outside the Naked Scientist together. And we also have a PhD student, and her name is Diana O'Carroll. And she is investigating for her thesis how people engage with and use things like podcast media and science educational materials and how audiences on the radio compare with audiences to podcasts because we're in a pretty unusual position where we're broadcasting our show to a radio audience and then we're broadcasting our show to an international internet audience and we want to know are the two very similar or not and the initial indications are they're totally different and so we've got the same program content appealing to two very different demographics and that's quite both academically but also commercially interesting. So Diana's researching that. And more recently, we took on another individual. Her name's Hannah Critchlow, and she's a neuroscientist. And so we're trying to build um, a traveling neuroscience stage show called Open Your Mind, which will go around Britain, educating people about the principles of biology and how the brain works. 
and it seems to be being pretty well received. We read people's brain waves, we give them lie detector tests, we stimulate the nervous system to make their muscles move without people wanting them to, and basically demonstrate how the nervous system works. Fantastic. You know, one area of science that is really, really fascinating to me at the moment is the, the fMRI, the functional MRI machines, where they can show people advertising messages, for example, and see which parts of their brain light up. And that's just, that's just I think the fMRI is going to lead to amazing things. It's a essentially a, a mind reading tool, which is somewhat scary, of course. But uh, <laughs> any, any thoughts on that? Just since you mentioned that you know, we're well, on one the, of the subject of science. One uh, of this area of mind reading is someone in your neck of the woods, um, Professor Jack Gallant in San Francisco. And I've actually had him on our program a number of times because he's published some very, very groundbreaking papers where by building very clever computer programs and then educating the computer program on volunteers in brain scanners who are shown a succession of images and then by the computer working out what is common to the brain's response and each of the images you can begin to build a predictive model of if I showed the brain this picture what would the brain activity do then you can turn the equation round and say well if I've got the brain activity pattern what must the person have been looking at to produce a pattern of activation like that and they've now been doing it with video sequences and they can show people sequences of movies and then they get the computer to go into YouTube and select bits of video that most closely match what the computer thinks the person must have seen. That is and unbelievable. It's absolutely spooky. When you see it, it, it sent a shiver down my spine, I can tell you. And Jack Gallant's pretty relaxed about the whole thing. <laughs> he just says, why? Well, it's pretty cool. Um, but it, yeah, it's fascinating. And that's what I love about doing what we do because you get to talk to some of the most incredible people and the world has shrunk. We're, we're talking to each other using Skype. The fact is that 10 years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And the world has shrunk. And the science that comes out of one bit of the world can be on the radio in another bit of the world literally instantly now. And you can have all these amazing conversations. And it's so easy to link people up. To have a good conversation with them, like you know, you, to have your level of interview skills, very different. But to link people up and have a good conversation and get the information out, it's never been easier. And I really love that. Yeah, it really, really is amazing. What tips or best practices would you like to just mention to other aspiring podcasters, Chris? You have done a phenomenal job with your show, so my hat's off to you, most definitely. But, you know, any tips to someone who's either thinking of starting a podcast or uh, just starting out and, and what they can do to be more successful? I would say, don't be frightened, just go and do it, because it's not going to cost very much. And you've got very little to lose. And it's definitely fun. And the thing that really motivated me was the fact that it's much more fun. Uh, I could say rather like sex. It's much more fun if you do it with other people. Because uh, <laughs> when, um, when we started the, the radio shows, it was never going to be about one person. And it was that wonderful experience of everyone getting together and doing something. And I think it's probably why people form bands when they're teenagers and they like playing instruments and you know doing stuff together. Because you do your bit and then they do their bit and the whole thing sounds great when you put it together and it's a wonderful team effect so I would urge people to team up with other people find someone who's like-minded then you share the load a bit you can have fun and you share quality time with a friend doing something that you're both learning something both enjoying it and there'll be twice as many ideas to go around whereas if you do it yourself it can become quite a grind I mean the thing that, that is hard about this is to produce content week in, week out, because the world of news, and especially science news, is never-ending. And it's quite a grind. And having someone to share the load with and to keep you going, I think, is, is quite important if you're going to go for sustainability and into the long term. But the number one most important thing is to have fun. If it's fun, then you, you will always carry on doing it because you'll see the point. Because we're only on this planet once. You've got to make the most of it. And that's what a very good friend of mine said to me. And it's made me think very carefully about you know, the rest of my life. You've got to make the most of every opportunity. And so if you're having fun doing something, it's worth it. Absolutely. Well, very good point. Well, Chris, thank you so much for sharing this with us today. It's Dr. Chris Smith, creator of the Naked Scientist podcast. And any websites you want to give out? I did give out the Naked Scientist website before, but anything else you'd like to leave the listeners with in terms of other resources or where they can learn more? Well, I would love people who listen to this program to please come and, if you haven't before, have a listen to the Naked Scientist as it sounds now, because some people may have heard us in the early days we have listened to what people have told us. They send us a lot of feedback. We've done these big surveys and things, and we have refined what we do, 
and we would really like people to come and give us a listen and if you enjoy it brilliant if you think there's something we could learn from you please tell us as well because at the end of the day we're only as good as people help us to be and please tell us if, if there's something you think we should be doing as well because you know we love giving people what they want so please come and give us a listen tell us what you think of us and hopefully stick with us too fantastic dr chris smith thank you so much for joining us today thank you for having me copyright the hartman media company for publication rights and interviews please email media at jasonhartman.com this show offers very general information opinions of guests are their own Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.